Chapter 2 of The Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Garrett Goodison. The Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers, by Catherine Crow. Chapter 2 The Dweller in the Temple. It is almost needless to observe that the scriptures repeatedly speak of a man in a tripartite being, consisting of spirit, soul, and body, and that according to St. Paul, we have two bodies, a natural body and a spiritual body, the former being designed as our means of communication with the external world, an instrument to be used and controlled by our nobler parts. It is this view of it, carried to a fanaticism, which has led to the various and extraordinary mortifications recorded of ascetics as is remarked by rev hare townshend in a late edition of his book on mesmerism in this fleshly body consists our organic life in the body which we are to retain through eternity consists our fundamental life may not the first he says be a temporary development of the last just as leaves flowers and fruits are the temporary development of a tree and in the same manner that these pass and drop away yet leave the principle of reproduction behind so may our present organs be detached from us by death and yet the ground of our existence be spared to us continuously without entering into the subtle disputes of philosophers with regard to the spirit a subject on which there is a standing controversy between the disciples of hegel and those of other teachers i need only observe that the scriptures seem to indicate what some of the heathen sages taught that the spirit that dwells within us is the spirit of god incorporated in us for a period for certain ends of his own to be thereby wrought out what those ends are, it does not belong to my present subject to consider. In this spirit so imparted to us dwells, says Eschenmayer, the conscience, which keeps watch over the body and the soul, saying, Thus shalt thou do. And it is to this Christ addresses himself when he bids his disciples become perfect, like their Father in heaven. The soul is subject to the spirit, and its functions are to will or choose, to think and to feel and to become thereby cognizant of the true, the beautiful, and the good, comprehending the highest principle, the highest ideal, and the most perfect happiness. The ego, or I, is the resultant of the three forces pneuma, psyche, soma, spirit, soul, and body. In the spirit or soul, or rather in both conjoined, dwells also the power of spiritual seeing, or intuitive knowing. For as there is a spiritual body, there is a spiritual eye, and a spiritual ear, and so forth. Or to speak more correctly, all these sensuous functions are comprised in one universal sense, which does not need the aid of the bodily organs, but, on the contrary, is most efficient when most freed from them. It remains to be seen whether, or in what degree, such separation can take place during life. Complete, it cannot be till death. But whoever believes sincerely that the divine spirit dwells within him can, I should think, find no difficulty in conceiving that, although from the temporary conditions to which the spirit is subjected, this universal faculty is limited and obscured, it must still retain its indefeasible attribute. We may naturally conclude that the most perfect state of man on earth consists in the most perfect unity of the spirit and the soul and to those who in this life have attained the nearest to that unity will the entire assimilation of the two after they are separated from the body be the easiest while to those who have lived only their intellectual and external life this union must be extremely difficult the soul having chosen its part with the body and divorced itself as much as in it lay from the spirit the voice of conscience is then scarcely heard and the soul degraded and debased can no longer perform its functions of discerning the true, the beautiful, and the good. On these distinct functions of the soul and spirit, however, it is not my intention to insist, since it appears to me a subject on which we are not yet in a condition to dogmatize. We know rather more about our bodies by means of which the soul and spirit are united and brought into contact with the material world, and which are constructed wholly with a view to the conditions of that world, such as time, space, solidity, extension, etc., etc. But we must conceive of God as necessarily independent of these conditions. To Him, all times and all places must be forever present. And it is thus 
that he is omniscient and omnipresent. And since we are placed by the Spirit in immediate relation with God and the spiritual world, just as we are placed by the body in immediate relation with the material world, we may, in the first place, form a notion of the possibility that some faint gleams of these inherent attributes may, at times, shoot up through the clay in which the Spirit has taken up its temporary abode, and we may also admit that through the connection which exists between us and the spiritual world, it is not impossible, but that we may at times, and under certain conditions, become cognizant of and enter into more immediate relation with it. This is the only postulate I ask. For as I said before, I do not wish to enforce opinions, but to suggest probabilities, or at least possibilities, and thus arouse reflection and inquiry. With respect to the term invisible world, I beg to remind my readers that what we call seeing is merely the function of an organ constructed for that purpose in relation to the external world, and so limited are its powers that we are surrounded by many things in that world which we cannot see without the aid of artificial appliances, and many other things which we cannot see even with them. The atmosphere in which we live, for example, although its weight and mechanical forces are the subjects of accurate calculation, is entirely imperceptible to our visual organs. Thus, the fact that we do not commonly see them forms no legitimate objection to the hypothesis of our being surrounded by a world of spirits, or of that world being interdiffused among us. Supposing the question to be decided that we do sometimes become cognizant of them, which, however, I admit it is not since whether the apparitions are subjective or objective, that is, whether they are the mere phenomena of disease or real outstanding appearances is the inquiry I desire to promote. But, I say, supposing that the questions were decided in the affirmative, the next that arises is how or by what means do we see them, or, if they address us, hear them. If that universal sense which appears to me to be inseparable from the idea of spirit be once admitted, I think there can be no difficulty in answering this question. And if it be objected that we are conscious of no such sense, I answer that both in dreams and in certain abnormal states of the body, it is frequently manifested. In order to render this more clear, and at the same time to give an interesting instance of this sort of phenomenon, I will transcribe a passage from a letter of St. Augustine to his friend Evadius, Epistola 159, Antwerp edition. I will relate to you a circumstance, he writes, which will furnish your matter for reflection. Our brother Senadius, well known to us all as an eminent physician, and whom we especially love, who is now at Carthage after having distinguished himself at Rome, and whose piety and active benevolence you are well acquainted, could yet, nevertheless, as he has lately narrated to us, by no means bring himself to believe in a life after death. Now, God, doubtless, not willing that his soul should perish, there appeared to him one night in a dream a radiant youth of noble aspect, who bade him follow him, and as Senadius obeyed, they came to a city where, on the right side, he heard a chorus of the most heavenly voices. As he desired to know whence this divine harmony proceeded, the youth told him that what he heard were the songs of the blessed, whereupon he awoke, and thought no more of his dream than people usually do. On another night, however, behold, the youth appears to him again and asks him if he knows him, and Senadius related to him all the particulars of his former dream, which he well remembered. Then, said the youth, was it while sleeping or waking that you saw these things? I was sleeping, answered Senadius. You are right, returned the youth. It was in your sleep that you saw these things, and know, O Senadius, that what you see now is also in your sleep. But if this be so, tell me, where then is your body? In my bedchamber, answered Senadius. But know you not, continued the stranger, that your eyes, which form a part of your body, are closed and inactive? I know it, answered he. Then, said the youth, with what eyes see you these things? And Senadius could not answer him. And as he hesitated, the youth spoke again, and explained to him the motive of his questions. As the eyes of your body, said he, which lies now on your bed sleeps, are inactive and useless, and yet you have eyes wherewith you see me, and these things I have shown unto you. So after death, when these bodily organs fail you, you will have a vital power, whereby you will live, and a sensitive faculty, 
whereby you will perceive. Doubt, therefore, no longer that there is a life after death. And thus, said this excellent man, was I convinced, and all doubts removed. I confess, there appears to me a beauty and a logical truth in this dream that I think might convince more than the dreamer. It is by the hypothesis of this universal sense, latent within us, an hypothesis which, whoever believes that we are immortal spirits, incorporated for a season in a material body, can scarcely reject, that I seek to explain those perceptions which are not comprised within the functions of our bodily organs. It seems to me to be the key to all or nearly all of them, as far as our own part in the phenomena extends. But, supposing this admitted, there would then remain the difficulty of accounting for the partial and capricious glimpses we get of it, while in that department of the mystery which regards apparitions, except such as are the pure result of disease, we must grope our way with very little light to guide us, as to the conditions and motives which might possibly bring them into any immediate relation with us. To any who has been fortunate enough to witness one genuine case of clairvoyance, I think the conception of this universal sense will not be difficult, however the mode of its exercise may remain utterly incomprehensible. As I have said above, to the great spirit and fountain of life, all things in both space and time must be present. However impossible it is to our finite minds to conceive this, we must believe it. It may, in some slight degree, facilitate the conception to remember that action, once begun, never ceases. An impulse given is transmitted on forever. A sound breathed reverberates in eternity. And thus the past is always present. Although, for the purpose of fitting us for this mortal life, our ordinary senses are so constituted as to be unperceptive of these phenomena. With respect to what we call the future, it is more difficult still for us to conceive it as present. Nor, as far as I know, can we borrow from the sciences the same assistance as mechanical discoveries have just furnished me with in regard to the past. How a spirit sees that which has not yet, to our senses, taken place, seems certainly inexplicable. Foreseeing, it is not inexplicable, we foresee many things by arguing on given premises, although, from our finite views, we are always liable to be mistaken. Louis Lambert says, Such events as are the product of humanity and the result of its intelligence have their own causes, in which they lie latent, just as our actions are accomplished in our thoughts previous to any outward demonstration of them. Presentiments and prophecies consist in the intuitive perception of these causes. This explanation, which is quite conformable with what of Cicero, may aid us in some degree as regards as a certain small class of phenomena. But there is something involved in the question much more subtle than this. Our dreams can give us the only idea of it, for there we do actually see and hear not only that which never was, but that which never will be. Actions and events, words and sounds, persons and places, are as clearly and vivid present to us as if they were actually what they seem. And I should think that most people must be somewhat puzzled to decide in regard to certain senses and circumstances that live in their memory, whether these images are the result of their waking or sleeping experience. Although by no means a dreamer, and without the most remote approximation to any faculty of presentiment, I know this is the case with myself. I remember also a very curious effect being produced upon me when I was abroad some years ago, from eating the unwholesome bread to which we were reduced in consequence of scarcity. Some five or six times a day I was seized with a sort of vertigo, during which I seemed to pass through certain scenes, and was conscious of certain words which appeared to me to have a strange connection, with either some former period of my life, or else some previous state of existence. The words and the scenes were on each occasion precisely the same. I was always aware of that, and I always made the strongest efforts to grasp and retain them in my memory. But I could not. I only knew that the thing had been. The words and the scenes were gone. I seemed to pass momentarily into another sphere and back again. This was purely the result of disorder. But, like a dream, it shows how we may be perceptive of that which is not, and which never may be, rendering it therefore possible to conceive that a spirit may be equally perceptive of that which shall be. I am very far from meaning to imply that these examples remove the difficulty, 
They do not explain the thing. They only show somewhat the mode of it. But it must be remembered that when physiologists pretend to settle the whole question of apparitions by the theory of spectral illusions, they are exactly in the same predicament. They can supply examples of similar phenomena, but how a person, perfectly in his senses, should receive the spectral visits of not only friends, but strangers, when he is thinking of no such matter, or by what process, mental or optical, the figures are conjured up, remains as much a mystery as before a line was written on the subject. All people and all ages have believed, more or less, in prophetic dreams, presentiments, and apparitions, and all historians have furnished examples of them. That the truths may be frequently distorted and mingled with fable is no argument against those traditions. If it were, all history must be rejected on the same plea. Both the Old and New Testaments furnish numerous examples of these phenomena, and although Christ and the Apostles reproved all the superstitions of the age, these persuasions are not included in their reprehensions. Neither is the comparative rarity of these phenomena any argument against their possibility. There are many strange things which occur still more rarely, but which we do not look upon as supernatural or miraculous. Of nature's ordinary laws, we yet know but little of their aberrations and perturbations still less. How should we, when the world is a miracle and life a dream, of which we know neither the beginning nor the end, we do not even know that we see anything as it is? Or rather, we know that we do not. We see things but as our visual organs represent them to us, and were those organs differently constructed, the aspect of the world would to us be changed. How then? Can we pretend to decide upon what is and what is not? Nothing could be more perplexing to anyone who read them with attention than the trials for witchcraft of the 17th century. Many of the feats of the ancient thaumaturgists and wonder-workers of the temples might have been nearly as much so, but these were got rid of by the easy expedient of pronouncing them fables and impostures. But during the witch-mania, so many persons proved their faith in their own miraculous powers by the sacrifice of their lives, that it was scarcely possible to doubt their having some foundation for their own persuasion, though what that foundation could be, till the late discoveries in animal magnetism, it was difficult to conceive. But here we have a new page open to us which concerns both the history of the world and the history of man as an individual, and we begin to see that which the ignorant thought supernatural, and the wise impossible, has been both natural and true. While the scientific men of Great Britain and several of our journalists have been denying and ridiculing the reports of these phenomena, the most eminent physicians of Germany have been quietly studying and investigating them, and giving to the world in their works the results of their experience. Among the rest, Dr. Joseph Annemoser of Berlin has presented to us in two books on magic and on the connection of magnetism with nature and religion, the fruits of his thirty years study of this subject, during the course of which he has had repeated opportunities of investigating all the phenomena and of making himself perfectly familiar with even the most rare and perplexing. To anyone who has studied these works, the mysteries of the temples and of the witch trials are mysterious no longer, and he writes with the professed design not to make science mystical, but to bring the mysterious within the bounds of science. The phenomena, as he justly says, are as old as the human race. Animal magnetism is no new development, no new discovery. Inseparable from life, although like many other vital phenomena, so subtle in its influences that only in abnormal cases it attracts attention, it has exhibited itself more or less in all ages and in all countries. But its value as a medical agent is only now beginning to dawn on the civilized world while its importance in a higher point of view is yet perceived by but few. Every human being who has ever withdrawn himself from strife and the turmoil and the distraction of the world without, in order to look within, must have found himself perplexed by a thousand questions with regard to his own being, which he would find no one able to solve. In the study of animal magnetism, he will first obtain some gleams of a light which will show him that he is indeed the child of God and that, though a dweller on the earth, and fallen, some traces of his divine descent, and of his unbroken connection with the higher order of being, still remain to comfort and encourage him. He will find that there exist in his species the germs of faculties that are never fully unfolded here on earth, and which have no reference in this state of being. 
They exist in all men, but in most cases are so faintly elicited as not to be observable, and when they do shoot up here and there, they are denied, disowned, misinterpreted, and maligned. It is true that their development is often the symptom and effect of disease, which seems to change the relations of our material and immaterial parts. It is true that some of the phenomena resulting from these faculties are stimulated by disease, as is in the case of spectral illusions. And it is true that imposture and folly intrude their unhallowed footsteps into this domain of science, as into that of all others. But there is a deep and holy well of truth to be discovered in this neglected by-path of nature, by those who seek it, from which they may draw the purest consolations for the present, the most ennobling hopes for the future, and the most valuable aid in penetrating through the letter into the spirit of the scriptures. I confess it makes me sorrowful when I hear men laughing, scorning, and denying this, their birthright, and I cannot but grieve to think how closely and heavily their clay must be wrapped about them, and how the external and sensuous life must have prevailed over the internal, when no gleam from within breaks through to show them that these things are true. End of chapter 2 Recording by Gareth Goodison